Welcome, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning. Um, I apologize that um, I will have to speak in English because my five weeks here have not managed to pick up the, uh, the Swedish language yet. So oh, I'll just that, adjust oh, this slightly. OK, please go on. <laughs> OK, right. Is, is, that, is that better? You can, you can all hear me. OK, right. Um, now, I should start off by saying that my um, expertise is really in, in the energy field. And obviously, I know that most of you here are experts in agriculture. But the storyline that I'm going to give for energy holds equally well and actually, is in some respects, is more challenging for the sectors that you're looking at. But I will come back to that as I go through the talk. Um, so I'm going to focus here on the 1.5 and 2 degrees C framing uh, that, that came out of the, the, the Paris Agreement. But before starting that, I think it's worth thinking a uh, backdrop to Paris. Before we actually attended Paris, what, what, what did we know? Well, we had since, since 1990, we had the first IPCC report. So 1990, a quarter of a century ago. So we've known everything we needed to know to respond to the climate change challenge scientifically for at least a quarter of a century. So what have we done in all of the effort that we've put in in that quarter of a century? Nothing. Yeah. The, the, the carbon dioxide emissions this year will be 60% higher than they were in 1990. So it has been a, um, a quarter of a century of abject failure, despite the fact we've had all the information that we needed to respond. We have chosen, and it's a choice, we have chosen not to respond to climate change, not just the people that flew here. Um, so if we go back then to the IPCC reports, I mean, they're also quite interesting. And what do they tell us prior to Paris? Well, they also changed the agenda. They changed the agenda from a focus when it comes to temperature on long-term targets towards carbon budgets. And if, if we're ever going to think about climate change, we should be informed by the concept of carbon budgets, not long-term targets. Long-term targets are politically very attractive, but have no scientific credibility. So what matters is not what happens in 2050 or 2030, but the total amount of carbon dioxide that we put in the atmosphere. The more we emit today, the less that we can emit tomorrow. And of course, that has fundamental um, political repercussions, not just at the top high level politics, but right down through into our universities and our institutions as well. Just thinking about this graphically, the budgets, just to make this really clear, this is our carbon dioxide emissions. Remember, this is during the period that we knew about climate change, and they just continued to rise. And if we're going to stick to a carbon budget, it is the area under the curve that matters. So it's that area under there. It is not what actually happens down here or here that matters. It's this total area. And of course, our emissions continue to go up at the moment, pretty much anyway. So that's the carbon budget arrangement. And the later that we leave responding to climate change, then the more we have to do in the future. So we, at the moment, we are choosing to do this. And that means we have to pass on to future generations the ability to do this, if that is possible at all. And that means they have to have much higher rates of reducing the emissions. So every day we fail, we pass on to our children a more challenging task than that that we faced. And then returning to the Paris Agreement, and this is the document that you, those of you who went there or had the pleasure of reading it, 32 pages of um, not particularly exciting text, but there are some really important things that are in it. And the part that I'm going to focus on here is this little bit of text there, but I'm not expecting to read that. Um, this is blown up here for you. It's to hold the increase to well below 2 degrees C. Notice that well below. It doesn't say a 50-50 chance of or, or a reasonably high chance of exceeding. It is well below 2 degrees centigrade. Limit to 1.5. To do so in the, in the, on the um, uh, accordance with the best science. And that is really probably what's captured in the IPCC. And also, very importantly, and usually ignored by most Western countries, to do so on the basis of equity. And that has, again, big repercussions for how we have to respond to climate change. So 2 degrees centigrade, 1.5, science and equity. And if you put those together, you can quantify what that would mean for different parts of the world. And I'll come back to that right at the end for an estimate that I've, I've done for what that would mean for a country like Sweden. Well, actually, for Sweden. I've done it for the UK as well. So you can actually use that to quantify the scale of the challenge and to test your policies against. There are some significant issues with the Paris, Paris Agreement. It's agreement about climate change, but makes, makes no reference to fossil fuels or decarbonisation. There's no reference to aviation and shipping, which are the um, equivalent of um, Germany and the UK's total emissions put together and are expected to grow very rapidly. The aviation industry expects them to broadly double by the time you get to 2050, and about four times increase for shipping. Um, the pledges that every country put in, the promises that we made to the Paris Agreement, when you add them all up, it's a three to four degrees C temperature increase. 
And given that the difference between now and an ice age is only five degrees, you know, three to four degrees C is a huge change to occur in just about 100 years. So we're talking about a dramatic change in, in how we would have to live our lives if we could live them at all. And there is no major review of the pledges that we made until 2023. And that will be about 300 billion tons of carbon dioxide from now. So we will continue to emit about that much carbon dioxide between now and then. And finally, and I'll come back to this later, there's a real focus on these negative emission technologies. It doesn't talk about them at all explicitly, but they are fundamental to delivering on the Paris Agreement. And actually, if you unpick the small bit of maths that are in there, it really makes it very clear you have to rely on those technologies. And that has big implications um, for agriculture. Now, before Paris, we were heading in this direction. This is what the International Energy Agency used to regularly say, that we were heading towards six degrees C if we carried on with business as usual. Um, and I think we have to be very clear here. You cannot be too precise about exactly what the temperature would be. Um, but nevertheless, we were aiming towards the sort of um, four degrees, five degrees, six degrees C future if we carried on as we were going before. With the um, pledges from Paris, we're now heading towards a three to four degrees C temperature rise, which is still far too high. Um, but what we did in Paris, we promised, although our pledges are for three, for three to four, we promised to deliver for future generations, for our own children, we promised to deliver no more than two, stay well below two. And that's the two degree C framing here. 1.5 would be considerably tighter, would be, would be zero by at least 2030, at the latest rather. So it would come down here. So that's the framework, and that's, this is the gap that we have to try and, try and fill, um, at least fill that gap, or overcome that gap. But this is, this is for the energy system. Aha, uh -huh. this is the problem of transporting from um, a Mac to a PC. I've lost some of the curve there. Hopefully it comes up. Did it come up? Uh, well, that's a bit better there. Okay, so um, this, is just, this is for a global energy system. And what does this mean about what we would need to do, the sorts of, sorts of framings of the policies? And again, this, this holds for agriculture as much as it does for um, energy. The first thing is that we have to cut our demand for energy. And we have to do that because we cannot make the reductions fast enough from this to here with energy supply. We cannot build enough low carbon power stations, we not, cannot build enough wind turbines or carbon capture storage or nuclear or solar panels. We cannot build them and put them in place and build the infrastructure quickly enough to make the transition. So in the short term, we have to reduce energy demand. But in the long term, the supply side is really important. And that's again will be the, very much the case in agriculture, that they will take time to change the infrastructure. So in the short to medium term, we have to change what it is that we eat to reduce our emissions, because you cannot overcome it with technology. And, it, and probably there's more you can do on the energy side with technology than you can do in agriculture. Um, but we have signed up to do this on the basis of equity. So we haven't just signed up, this is a global picture. We haven't just said, well, this is fine. We've then said, but we agree that the poor parts of the world will have longer to make the transition. We've expressly agreed that in the Paris Agreement. So if we go and look at the carbon budgets, what does that actually play out? How does that look like for us? Now, we're focusing it here on uh, quite a lot of people here on 1.5 degrees centigrade. Now, we are going to use up the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees centigrade in between 3 and 13 years of current emissions. There will be no carbon budget left for 1.5 degrees centigrade. And 13 years is really the very top end of that. So that's been incredibly optimistic on climate sensitivity. So our pledges are not reviewed until 2023, 300 billion tons of carbon dioxide from now. So from a budget perspective, it is, a, in any reasonable sense, it is too late for 1.5 degrees centigrade. Uh, if you look at it from a budget point of view, are we going to make those sorts of profound changes in, one and a half, in, in, in three to 13 years to get to 1.5 degrees centigrade? We're almost certainly going to go above that temperature threshold. But actually, the story, although it's a little bit more hopeful with 2 degrees C, is even, it's still incredibly tight for even 2 degrees centigrade. A good chance of 2 degrees centigrade we have lost. We have chosen not to do enough, or chosen to do nothing. So 2 degrees centigrade, a good chance has now gone. And 2 degrees centigrade is about 6 degrees warming in the poles. So this is, this is not a small temperature increase. Many people will die at 2 degrees C. They'll be poor, they'll be non-white, and they'll live a long way from here, and they'll be low emitters. They will have had nothing to do with the problem. But we have chosen to say, well, to be honest, we don't really care that much about them. If you even went to the 50-50 chance, which is still just about viable of 2 degrees centigrade, imagine, would you do that in a plane? If 2 degrees C is dangerous, would you get on a plane if it only had a 50% chance of landing safely? You wouldn't do, would you? But we're doing that experiment on the planet where we all live, where our children live. But even a 50% chance, that would require us to think of a warlike footing on climate change. We'd have to be making dramatic changes to how we live our lives. 
when we're in here today on a sunny day in Stockholm with the curtains closed and the lights on. Yeah. Isn't that, and that's how far we've got. We still haven't found a way of opening the curtains, letting the daylight in and switching the lights off. 33% chance is about the best that we can now do. An outside chance of two degrees centigrade. And that, now, we, that's, we have to think about that. That's what we have decided um, is the best that we can actually hand on to future generations. So what's this mean for richer and poorer parts of the world if we're going to deliver on that sort of promise? Well, for poorer parts of the world, let's be really optimistic. If the poorer parts of the world that are dominated by China's emissions at the moment, and China still is a very poor country when you look at its emissions per capita from a consumption-based point of view, not from a territorial, but from a consumption-based, you know, in terms of the goods that they make for us as well. If they could peak their emissions by 2025, which is just about viable, just about viable, and in, in Paris they said it would be 2030, and India said 2020, 2040, but that would still be a viable goal for China, and quite a lot of Chinese scholars think that as well. But then they would have to rapidly reduce their emissions by up to 10% per annum from every, every single year, post-2035. 10% every year. That's three times faster than the economists tell us is possible with economic growth. So it's, it's, this is a huge request of those parts of the world. And their energy system would need to be zero carbon by 2050. And the, uh, alongside that would be profound changes to how they ran their agricultural systems as well. And they would have to think very seriously about what sort of agricultural systems they're going to be using when they're trying to feed their increasing populations. For the wealthy countries, this is really a, bit, a simple bit of maths. We know the carbon budget then for the, for the poorer parts. We have the carbon budget for two degrees centigrade, and we can work out what's the carbon budget for us. And we can then we can do the maths around that. And that would mean at least a 10% per annum reduction in emissions starting now, starting this year. And I'll come back right at the end. It's actually slightly higher for Sweden and countries like the UK as well, because we're slightly wealthier than the average of the wealthy countries. That's about a 50% reduction by 2020. Now, the, these numbers really, although they're for energy, they're really a very good guide for the sorts of reductions you would need to deliver in agriculture. And I don't mean efficiency. I mean absolute reductions in emissions. Making things more efficient does not mean you reduce your emissions. 75% reduction by 2025, about a 90% reduction by 2030, and zero carbon energy by 2035. Zero carbon energy, not just electricity, everything by 2035. And yet what we submitted to Paris, Sweden and the UK, or at least just the UK, as part of the EU, um, was a 40% reduction by 2030. So you know, less than half that we would need to do to make our, our fair contribution to a relatively high chance of exceeding 2 degrees C, a temperature threshold at which many people will die. So that's the best that we could think we thought we could do. And yet, when we were at Paris, we all celebrated. We all thought it was wonderful. Stars flew there in their private jets, and they clinked their champagne glasses with great politicians and said, aren't we all wonderful people? But actually, this is you know, what we're handing to our future generations. Should we really have been celebrating in the way that we were? There were obviously some very good things that came out of Paris. But I think we should be a bit more careful about our celebration of um, what we've achieved until we've actually achieved something. So how are we going to reconcile these two positions? The euphoria we saw in Paris with um, actually what the maths tell us about climate change. And we're going to do it by having a magician pull rabbits out of the hat. And this is what we're relying on. This is what Sweden's relying on, the UK is relying on, the world is now relying on this, because it does not want to make any profound changes itself. We're going to rely on negative emission technologies, which sounds quite nice. It sounds like something that actually exists. We're going to suck huge quantities of carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere in years to come. So rather than us change our behavior, we're going to ask our children to find a technology and do this for us. And the one that is really popular, and again has big agricultural implications, huge agricultural implications, um, is biomass energy with carbon capture and storage. So we're going to plant trees and, um, and other forms of, of um, biomass material, miscanthus and switchgrass. We're going to grow these trees and plants. We're going to harvest them. We're going to transport them around the world. And as they grow, of course, they absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. And we're going to burn them in our power stations. We're going to capture the carbon dioxide as it goes up the chimney. And then we're going to liquefy the carbon dioxide, or almost liquefy it, and store it underground for a few thousand years. That's what we're relying on at huge scale. Um, this has never worked at scale. We've never achieved this from any power station at any scale, other than just at almost experimental level. There are huge technical and economic unknowns. Even with carbon capture, storage alone is challenging. It's even more challenging when you start putting biomass into the power stations. There are large efficiency penalties with it, and there's very limited biomass availability. Everyone wants biomass. The aviation industry wants it, the shipping industry wants it, the chemical industry wants it, and so does this technology here, BEX. Um, and uh, there are some estimates to say that you have huge impacts on biodiversity. 
that actually the amount of BECs that is assumed in the models is the equivalent of a temperature increase of 2.8 degrees C in terms of the effects on biodiversity. So there are some really big concerns there. Just to give some sort of scale of this, it's the equivalent of planting out an area of one to three times the size of I India every single year, decade after decade, right through to beyond the end of the century, storing hundreds of billions of tons of CO2, hundreds of billion tons of CO2. This is more than humans have ever done in any field. This is more than we produce in cement or steel or waste around the planet added together. These are numbers that we have no comprehension of and store this underground for thousands of years. Just to give a, a sort of a more, um, more tangible sense of what it is, this is, this is where we live, and currently this planet absorbs about half of the carbon dioxide emissions that we put in the atmosphere, th through the oceans and through the plant life on the, on the planet. So we, we pump out about 40 billion tonnes, and it, it absorbs about 20 billion tonnes. The guidance that has been given to governments by the economic and combined with climate models is that we will find another one of these planets somewhere nearby, the equivalent of, and suck out between 10 and 20 billion tons. So th this is the assumption that we will find that much um, ability to absorb carbon dioxide. It's like attaching another biosphere to our planet. That is the scale of the reductions that we are assuming will be made by future generations to allow us to carry on living the lives that we are living today. So Paris, some academics and politicians, rather than focus on deep and urgent mitigation today, which would be very difficult for us, have big pl um, political and <coughs> economic repercussions, we have chosen to hand on to future generations a reliance on negative emission technologies to remove huge quantities of CO2 from the air. So this is a really quite a, quite a damning story. Um, <coughs> now, this all looks too challenging. So if it is too challenging, another problem with, with apples and PCs here, that, four, that should be four degrees C up here. If this is too challenging, well, what happens if we go to a higher temperature? Is it reasonable to think we could accept three or four degrees C? <coughs> Unfortunately, there's not a lot of data out there on what the impacts look like at three or four. Most people are focused on two degrees C. But there's a little bit of work out there, and I'm using something here from the, from the Met Office. They did this a few years ago in the UK. At four degrees centigrade, um, the impacts for that are what happens during the extreme. So imagine during a heat wave, and maybe that's quite hard to imagine in, in Sweden or indeed in the UK, but you know, we, we, we're aware of these, they do occur across, across Europe. 2003, 20 to 30,000 people died in Europe during the heat wave in 2003. During the hottest periods of the year, during heat waves, which would then be prolonged at four degrees centigrade, you'd have about eight degrees C additional warming in Europe, um, about six degrees C in China, and 10 to 12 degrees C in some parts of the States. That's on top of the temperature you're already seeing during a heat wave. So what does that start to mean? That means things like the tarmac on our roads, the covering of our roads starts to melt. It means our train lines start to buckle. It means the power lines that come underground in cities and towns to our fridges to keep our food cold during a heat wave would no longer be cooled. They're cooled by soil moisture. The moisture would evaporate, the cables aren't cooled, the cables can't bring the power in, the fridges stop working. So do the showers stop working, so we can't keep cool at night by having a shower, which is really an important way to stop dying in a heat wave, to keep cool at night. So actually, the infrastructure in industrialized countries would start to break down at these sorts of temperatures. So we, we cannot think we are insulated from this sort of future. And remember, infra infrastructures take hundreds of years to put in place. I'm not sure how old this building is here, but you know, we, we live in buildings and infrastructures that have been developed and evolved from the Roman times, if not before. So things are not looking good from that point of view, but also from the food point of view, and I think this is, this is work that definitely needs to be repeated um, and to see what the results would be with the latest data. About a 40% reduction in some of the staple crops in, in the southern hemisphere, a 30% reduction in yields of rice. These are big reductions at four degrees centigrade. Um, at the same time, the world population is heading towards nine billion. So this, this is not a world that we should be looking, looking to, to um, head towards. There was a widespread view amongst the climate scientists I've engaged with, and this is anecdotal, but I mean, it'd be interesting to hear if anyone here would disagree with this, that it, four degrees C is sort of incompatible with um, an organized global community. How do we normally respond to this? Men normally reach for guns and start to fight with, fight with each other when the resources get that tight. We saw that in Darfur with the, with the changes in pasture lands, and some people argue that some of the reasoning behind some of the tensions that have occurred in Syria and so forth have been exacerbated, not caused by, but exacerbated by some of the um, changes in the weather patterns they were seeing, which may be um, related to climate change. It's beyond adaptation. We will not be able to adapt to these sorts of changes. This is far, far too fast for us to adapt to. 
Um, many ecosystems will be destroyed. The, the <coughs> emblematic ones, like the barrier reef and the, and the rainforest, will be um, either completely uh, destroyed or seriously denuded from where they are today. But, but you know, beyond those ones, things like the pollination of plants by insects and so forth, that will be seriously changed as well. So significant impacts on food. And it's very unlikely that these temperatures would be stable. So you get four degrees centigrade, you get more melting of the permafrost, you get more methane, you get the oceans pump, pumping out more CO2, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as their temperature rises as well. So you'd likely see ongoing increases in temperature. So four degrees C would be on a path to a new equilibrium, five, six, seven, wherever it may stop in the future. So it would very unlikely be stable. So my polling, um, anecdotal polling of the scientists is that four degrees C should be avoided at all costs. And for those who are economists, the word all undermines the concept of discounting. You cannot discount the future. So let's go back to two degrees C and some finish off with some more hopeful slides. There are things that we can do to hold the two degrees centigrade. And some people would argue for one and a half. I think that is probably pushing it quite hard now. But, um, so it is still a viable goal. Um, as I said, I think the outside chance of two degrees C is the best that we can hope for now. And the things I'm going to focus on and just touch on, um, technology can do a lot. As an engineer, I'm really pleased about this but it is not going to resolve the problem. It can do a lot on the supply side in decadal time frames. It can do a lot on the demand side in, in just actually a number of years out to a decade. But beyond that, that is not going to be enough. We have to do something about reducing our emissions by changes in behavior, in practices, in structures, and the way that we run our organizations. Um, so I'm going to just touch on those as well. So for the supply side, firstly, we often think of, of technology as maintaining the status quo, is it's the thing that will allow us to carry on living our lives as we live them today. But that's not going to happen, and I'm going to try and show you why. But it can do a lot. So on the supply, there were lots of things here, which I'm not going to go into details with, whether it's geothermal, whether it's wind, whether it's nuclear, whether it's um, hydro schemes, or whether it's solar panels. There are lots of technologies, but there's also um, uh, uh, biomass, which is uncertain as to whether that's sustainable or not. depends how it's done and whether it's necessarily low carbon or not. Tidal, wave, and carbon capture and storage which actually is not really low carbon, but sort of medium level carbon. So there are lots of technologies out there. And no doubt, in the, again, in the agricultural sector, there are plenty of things that we know how to do. We're just choosing not to do them many of the times, much of the time. Um, but let's also be aware when we look at energy that most of the energy we consume is not electricity. Everything I pointed out there, almost everything, was about low carbon electricity. In Sweden, electricity is 30% is uh, of what you consume. 70% of the energy you consume in Sweden is not electricity. So what you also have to have is a massive program of electrification. So you, you basically got to electrify as much of your energy system as you possibly can, as quickly as possible. And I know there's some discussion about that here and in Norway and other parts of Europe as well. But nevertheless, it, that is a huge challenge as well. So the demand side, I'm just going to use the example of private cars here. Without thinking about electric cars, we should be moving to electric cars, but actually we should be driving much less. We should be cycling more. We should be using, using more virtual communication. Um, but just think about what we could do with existing technologies. Cars are responsible for about 12 to 15 percent of emissions. There are now over 300, in fact, there are now almost 400 model cars in the EU that are available that are under 100 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometer traveled. The average person, the average car in Sweden, I'm guessing, is about 160 to 170 grams. The average car being sold now is about 130 to 135 grams. And yet all of these cars are available now at no price premium. And they, fulf they fulfill every single function um, of a car in terms of its transport uh, requirements. The only thing, it doesn't, doesn't embed, in, embed necessarily issues of status, which many of us, is why we buy more powerful cars. It's not so we can go faster, but because we like the idea of having powerful cars. It says something about us. And that looks to be the case in Sweden as it is in the UK as well. Two thirds of all car travel is traveled by cars that are under eight years old. You put those things together, you've got a really hopeful opportunity to change things. If you had very stringent CO2 standards, um, and these are set at a maximum level, not the fleet average is what we have today, then with existing cars, at no additional capital cost, at reduced fuel costs, because we wouldn't need to have as much, identical, identical infrastructure, and the same companies that produce the cars, so there's not an employment issue. You could have about a 50 to 70% reduction in 10 years. Policymakers could be doing this today, and could have been doing this for the last five or seven years, and have chosen not to do it. And this, so this is a win-win opportunity. Now, if we did this across the sectors, across all sectors, we should have, you know, um, uh, very, very stringent efficiency standards, basically the top runner program they use in Japan. The best that's available should be the average. The best available today should be the average by tomorrow or next year. And you keep ratcheting up like that. 
So very efficient tight standards, tighten them every single year, provide long-term and dynamic market signals, and you, you industrialize wealthy nations, very, uh, in, in industrial and West wealthy nations, you would have something like a 40 to 70% reduction in energy demand in about 10 years. That is viable today. And I'm just gonna finish off by just saying that this is not enough. Technology is not enough. We need to move towards making changes in how people like us do what we do. And just to think about this, and the final few slides here, I'll be as quick as I can on these, on um, CO2 asymmetry, about who, do the, who puts the emissions into the atmosphere. 50% of global emissions come from 10% of the population. We know who they are. We see them when we shave or when we put our makeup on in the morning. The top 1% of emitters in the US have carbon footprints the same size as, as um, or two and a half thousand times bigger rather than the bottom 1% globally. You know, that, is that appropriate in a world that's trying to deal with climate change? Who's in this top 10%? If we can identify who they are, then we can really make some big changes. If the top 10%, people like us, cut our emissions to the level of the average European, the average European, that would be a 33% cut in global emissions. We're not even prepared to do that on climate change. But who's in this group? Well, climate scientists, policymakers, frequent flyers. Um, I noticed that was it three to five people flew here. Um, they, they will definitely be in that category, but the rest of us will be there as well. Equity changes, uh, changes the whole framing of climate change. It's not a problem for seven billion people to reduce their emissions. It's a problem for a few people like us. And the same, there's a small you know, group of China and India as well, not just the rich countries, but there are rich people all around the world with high emissions. There's a huge asymmetry. We could have rapid near-term reductions if people like us changed our behaviors and our structures in our institutions. We could lead by example, and we would catalyze system change. So putting all of this together, if we are serious about two degrees centigrade, then we need to have deep and rapid reductions in energy demand by the high emitters. And this is also true of the agricultural sector. Huge changes in, in, the dairy, in, in our use of dairy and huge changes in our use of meat. We know where the emissions come from in agriculture, and we know what we need to be doing on the demand side. And then the supply side, we need a Marshall-style plan, like a rebuilding program of zero carbon energy supply that has to be done globally by 2050. That's just about viable. And I'll just finish off with these targets for Sweden. Now, these are the same, vet, same guidance for agriculture as it is for, for energy. If we're lucky on the, on the carbon budgets, then you require about a 70% reduction, 70-75% reduction by 2025. As I said before, 95% reduction by 2035. That's about 12% per annum reductions every single year starting now. 12% every year in energy for the optimistic budget of an outside chance of 2 degrees C, or 50-50 chance at best. If you're unlucky on climate sensitivity, then your mitigation rate needs to be 25% every single year starting now. Now, this is a completely different agenda than what we normally talk about. These are profound political and social changes for an outside chance of two degrees C. So on that note, um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Kevin.